Um, we're going to talk about fighting for yourself, and I'm calling this men's edition. Men's edition. We've been talking about how to fight spiritually for yourself, how to know what the enemy's doing, to see those schemes, to go against those things. But today I specifically want to talk to the men, and in the midst of that, I almost subtitled this thing, No Rompers. Some of you know what that means, No Rompers. Our society is driving the masculinity out of men. Amen. Okay, and, and so here are my ground rules to start. So this may shut down some of your emails and texts later today. Here are my ground rules. I have no problem with men expressing their feelings. I don't. I have no problem with men being kind and men being tender when they need to be. I have no problem rejecting the macho male stupidity that can go on, uh, the, the redneck stupidity that can go on in our society when you talk about men. And I have no problem with women having whatever jobs they want. So this is not a feminist speech I'm going through here, okay? Uh, what I want to talk about is the feminization of men and the scheme of the enemy to do that and our ability to recognize it and stand against it. Here's what I mean. Yeah, I began to look at what are some of the reasons why there's this shift toward femininity in men in our society. And, and, and you know, the first one I mentioned already, I mean, we just recently had this release of rompers. Rompers from, if you don't know what a romper is, it's where they take a shirt and a pair of shorts and they make it one piece and it's out of silk. It's ridiculous. Anyways, uh, it's one of those things that's being, and then they made them out of lace to go on top of that. So yeah, I, I, I'm just, yeah, not at my house, not at my house. Uh, this is another one I saw, the clip on man bun. Okay, you know how women wear buns and now men are wearing buns? Well, now they have a clip-on bun in case you... And I'm thinking, where is your credibility as a man if you can't grow your hair long enough that you have to have a clip-on man bun? I mean, there's no credibility in that at all. Uh, we have a, sh a move toward transvestites in our society. We have entire clubs where men go to to dress and act as women. It's a bizarre thing we're moving into. I, I saw a deal the other day, and I don't mean to get too, uh, too much information here, where a man actually had breast implants put in so he could be a better female impersonator. And I'm just thinking, where are we going with this? We have, we have legal discussions right now going on in this country about whether or not we need to take gender off of our driver's license. So there's just an X there instead of male or female. That's going on right now. Canada has a law being put in place right now to stop the use of pronouns as it describes a man and fee a woman. So no longer he and she, just it and they. Okay? Uh, that's, that's important. There's plastic surgery for men on the rise where they're getting muscle implants. I'm thinking if you can't go to the gym and get them on your own, why would you want fake ones? Okay, we have hair waxing for men. I'm not even going there. Okay, five-year-old boys deciding they're a girl and the parents agreeing. We just have stuff going on. There is actually a, a, a man who was transgendered into a woman in the MMA, mixed martial arts fighting arena, and they're letting him fight the women, and needless to say, he's dominating. And it doesn't make sense to me. Uh, I, I, in Sweden, they now have gender-neutral preschools where they will not call your children boys and girls. Uh, crazy stuff. We have this whole Bruce Jenner, uh, he's not Caitlyn, what he is is messed up Bruce in a dress. Uh. Every television show you watch, you think about it, every television show you watch has an effeminate man in the show. He's part of the cast of characters. And another thing I include in this is if your opinion offends me, you can't have that opinion. Dude, that's just wrong. Listen, if you got an opinion that's different from mine, then I have to respect the fact that you have an opinion that's different from mine. And listen, if I can't convince you that my opinion over your opinion is right, then I need to go back and look at my opinion. Not be offended and tell you you can't have your opinion because it doesn't agree with me. Now, I don't blame society so much as I blame the enemy and a scheme that the enemy is currently working and the blindness of our men to that scheme. Mm, yeah. So I, I may be asking the question, which one of you women want one of these men? 
I mean, do you know why a lot of times a girl has an effeminate guy as a best friend? Because she doesn't want him as a husband. Think about that. Now, I want you to remember my disclaimer. I'm not a homophobic, redneck, macho jerk. That's not what I'm saying at all. I'm just looking for men to walk and talk and act like men. And to walk and talk like men. The men that we were described to be in Scripture. Listen, sensitivity and tolerance are two completely different things. You can be a sensitive man. Sensitivity and effeminateness are two completely different things. I believe a man defined as a godly man is a sensitive man, but that doesn't make him effeminate and tolerant. I'm looking for characters in the Bible that I see. Some of these that I put on my list may surprise you for why you're there, but this is more than just acting tough. I look at a guy like Joseph, the husband of Mary, mother of Jesus. Joseph wanted to put Mary away quietly. He had enough integrity and care and concern for her that he did not want her disrespected. So he said, look, I don't want to marry her because she's pregnant and it's not by me, but I want to do it quietly. I, I, not because I'm ashamed of myself, but because I don't want it to be a reflection of her. That's character in him. That's strength in him. There's a guy named Benaniah in 1 Chronicles 11:22. It says, he killed a lion in a pit on a snowy day. Now, that may not seem much talk to you, but go read that story about Chronicles. They're just talking about Benaniah, and out of nowhere it says, oh, and by the way, he killed a lion in a pit on a snowy day. He was unafraid. He was unafraid. Joshua, after losing to Jericho, uh, meaning uh, the walls fell and they went in, but they got the, uh, uh, the gold and silver, Ken did, and then they went to Ai, and they actually lost the battle in Ai. If you look at what Joshua did, he gathered all the people together, and he read them the entire Mosaic law. Here's what he did. He said, the reason we lost to the AI was because we failed in sin. So I'm going to go back and I'm going to read you the entire law, the entire Torah. I want you to be strong in the Lord and strong in his word. If you look at Jacob, who was later named Israel, he worked 14 years for Rachel. Seven years he was deceived, and then he worked an additional seven. Why? Because he was committed. He had a legitimate love for her. He was a man who said, I am willing to do whatever it takes to get her. And listen, if you want to hear me defend my wife, talk bad about her. Mm. She's worth it to me. Okay, so David does not kill Saul in the cave when he has the opportunity to kill Saul. Why? Because he honors God's chosen. He knows what God would say about him coming. Even though he's supposed to be the next king, he doesn't kill Saul because he has honor. David has a group of mighty men in 2 Samuel 23 that are risk takers. And I believe this is part of being a man. It says, David had a craving and said, Oh, that someone would give me water to drink from the well of Bethlehem, which is by the gate. Now, keeping in mind, Bethlehem is behind the enemy lines at this time. It's on the other side of the Philistine camp. So three mighty men broke through the camp of the Philistines. They drew water from the well of Bethlehem, which was by the gate, and they took it to David. Men who would say, if our leader needs a drink of water and it's in a dangerous place, we'll just go get it. We'll just go get it because we want to support him. Uh, Abraham, who is willing to sacrifice his son out of obedience to God. God, whatever you declare is what you want me to do, I'm in. I will walk in faith. I will believe you. Moses, Moses, who led millions of whiny people for 40 years always complaining about the leeks and onions back in Egypt and not enough water while they're being delivered from their slavery on their way to a promised land. They're complaining and he stays in there. Listen, I think it was because Moses understood his calling. He understood it was his job to get them from slavery to the promised land. I look at Stephen. Stephen who stands up and boldly proclaims Jesus and while he's being stoned, still proclaims. He is dedicated. He looks up and he says, I see Jesus at the right hand of the Father. I look at the guy like the Roman centurion who came to Jesus and said, my servant is dying. And Jesus said, okay, I'll come with you. And he said, no, you don't have to 
Because you're a man of authority, and I understand authority, so you speak it, and it'll happen. He knew what it meant to be in authority. Paul gets bit by a poisonous snake and shakes it off. He's just been shipwrecked. He floats on a piece of wood over to an island. They're cold. They make a fire. Out of the fire comes a snake, latches itself to his hand, and everybody says, he must be a bad man because a poisonous snake bit him and he's going to die. Paul just shakes it off. Do you know why he just shook it off? Because God told him, you're going to Rome. He wasn't in Rome yet, so he knew he wouldn't die from that snake. Get that snake out of here. I'm on my way to Rome. Yeah. And then obviously the most credible example we have of a man in the Bible is Jesus. Willing to be brutally beat to death and hung on the cross to benefit somebody else. He was self-sacrificing. Men are self-sacrificing people. If I, to make a short list of words that describe a man, they are courageous, they have strength, they have wisdom, they take risk, they are masculine and yet sensitive. They are loyal, they are loving, they have character, they are solid, they're respected, and they're godly men. Yes. Godly men. But let me give you some words that shouldn't describe a man. It shouldn't be described of a man that he is a weak, effeminate, afraid, inconsistent, uncommitted, whiny, undependable, unfaithful, or prissy. I just like that word. Because I don't think any woman wants a man who's prissy. Is there any woman in here who wants a husband who's prissy? Yeah, I didn't think I'd get many show of hands there. In 1 Corinthians 6, 9, not talking specifically to men, but just listen to the list as it describes the people in the kingdom of God. Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Don't be deceived. Neither fornicators or idolaters or adulterers or effeminate or homosexuals or thieves or covetous or drunkards or revilers or swindlers, none of those will inherit the kingdom of God. And just so you know, that word effeminate there means unnaturally lewd, unnaturally lewd people. These things do not describe a godly man. So I want to talk a little bit today about how do we step into that role, man? How do we step into the role of being a godly man, the kind described in the Bible so we can accomplish the things that the men in the Bible accomplished? And the easiest one for me is to go to Psalms chapter one, the whole chapter, Psalms chapter one. So if you got a Bible, turn there. If not, you can look up at the screens. It'll be up there. I just want to walk through this chapter. I want to show you what it means for men. And I want you to note that this is the very first psalm that is recorded for us. It is Psalms 1 out of 150 of them. This is the one chosen to be first. Here's what it says. How blessed. Now to start with it, blessed for our purposes of reading this today would be how happy. How blessed. How happy is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked. He does not take advice from wicked men. What is wicked? In the actual Greek, the language, or in the actual Hebrew here, the actual language means hostile to God. In other words, somebody's not following God. Somebody doesn't want anything to do with God. The, the happy, the blessed man doesn't take advice from him. Why would we take advice from people who don't know God? Why as a man would I take advice from someone who doesn't know God? So if I need business advice, I'm going to a Christian business person. If I need financial advice, I'm going to a Christian who is wealthy. If I need marriage advice, I'm going to a Christian counselor who's married. Remember that last part's really important. If you're going to get marriage counseling, if you're someone who's married. Now look at the next line. Nor stand in the path of sinners. We hear this in 1 Corinthians 5.13. It says, bad company corrupts good morals. Don't be in the path of the sinner. Don't stand in that path trying to succeed in the world system without God. It says, nor sit in the seat of scoffers. The definition of scoffer there means a person who arrogantly mocks. Arrogantly mocks. And the key word there would be arrogant. But I want you to see something in case you didn't see it. How blessed is the man who doesn't walk in the counsel of the wicked, nor stand in the path of sinner, nor sit 
in the seat of scoffer. I don't know if you see the progression, but the progression is going towards stopping. The progression is headed toward stillness and death and consumed by evil. Blessed is the man who doesn't start on that path to death. Blessed is the man who runs the race. Blessed is the man who sees the schemes of the evil one and doesn't get to a place where he just sits. Mm. Two, but his delight is in the law of the Lord and in his law he meditates day and night. Now that law there represents the Torah. It's the instruction of God. It's the fullness of the instruction of God. And he says, one who delights in that instruction of God. But notice it says, and in his law he meditates day and night. Now I'm pretty sure we were not meant to stay up 24 hours a day. There's this thing called sleep and rest that God designed. But he said meditate on it day and night. Not a quiet time 30 minutes in the morning. Not a church goer on Sunday. But listen to me. Every aspect of life is guided by the instruction of God. Everything I do as a man should be under the instruction of God. So listen to me. If God says a man should rest, then a man should rest. If God says a man should fight, then a man should fight. If God says a man should have character and honor, then I need to develop character and honor. Every part of my life, God wants you to succeed at every godly thing in your life. Verse 3, this is unique. He will be a tree, man, you will be a tree firmly planted by streams of water. Why is he using that example? What's the correlation there for you and me? Listen to me. The word planted is very specific. It doesn't mean a sprig that grew on its own. It means something put there on purpose. It was planted there on purpose. Matthew 15, 13 says this. But he answered and said, every plant which my heavenly father did not plant will be uprooted. The father plants you, man, plants you at this time. One of my favorite verses is in uh, Acts 17. I think it's around verse 20. It says that he has designed this time and this boundary of habitation for you. You're not here accidentally. You're not in 2017 accidentally. You're not at Revive Church accidentally. You're not in the marriage you're in accidentally. He has planted you in a place that he wants you. And then it says he's going to be planted uh, by the streams of water. What are we talking about when we talk about water? What is water to a tree? Water to a tree is its source of life. It goes to water in order to have nourishment, in order to grow, in order to be strong. Isaiah 44, 3. I will put out water on a thirsty land and streams on the dry ground. Now watch. And I will pour out my spirit on your offspring and my blessing on your descendants. Do you see how he put water and the Holy Spirit in the same thought? He's saying that that water that you get nourished from represents the spirit. You are planted by God where you are in order for you to draw from the Holy Spirit for your life, for your substance. Yeah. Let's go back to Psalms into verse 3. He will be like a tree firmly planted by streams of water, which yields fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither. What is he saying there? He's saying when I draw the Holy Spirit into my life and it becomes my substance, I produce a fruit in its season. Listen, here's the, here's the easy way to capsulize that. I become productive at the right time. I become productive at the right time. I know when to produce. I know what I'm producing. And I produce when I'm supposed to produce. And then it finally says, and in whatever he does, he prospers. Not if you've got the guarantee that's sitting right there in Psalms 1. If you stay clear of sin, if you meditate on his word, if you drink from the spirit, you will prosper. You will prosper. Why? Because God has planted you by that stream and asked you to meditate on his word day and night so that you will prosper. <clears throat> you women are elbowing those guys right now. You should be there. <laughs> but look at the opposite that happens in verse 4. Just so you can watch how he talks. I think this is poetic, amazing. It says, the wicked are not so, but they are like chaff which the wind drives away. See, chaff is that outer dry shell on wheat that gets 
blown away. It is dried out. They flip it up in the air. The wheat falls. The chaff blows away because it has no moisture. There's no spirit there. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in judgment, nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. You see him say, hey, if you do these things, if you draw from that water, if you meditate on my word day and night, you are planted by me, you will prosper. But the wicked will not prosper prosper. They will perish. But I don't know if you saw this poetic justice he also did here. In verse 4, he says, like the chaff that the wind drives away. So the chaff is in motion. In essence, the chaff walks away. And then you look at 5 and it says, therefore the wicked will not stand in judgment, nor the sinners in the assembly. When we assemble, we sit. He just did the opposite with the wicked. He said, those that don't run, those that are sitting, those that are in that path, they will not prosper. And so I think what we're talking about today, maybe in a, in a general sense, when we look at Psalms 1 and say, if this were my guide, if I knew God had a plan and a purpose for me, and he planted me here today, right now, in this place, and I were willing to meditate on his word, just see who he is, what his character is, and if I were willing to press into Holy Spirit and say, feed me, nourish me, grow me, would I become the man that I was designed? God says, you will prosper in all that he puts before you. Now, I want to be careful what I'm about to do here, so stay with me. I want to briefly speak to men about raising children. <clears throat> Boys need to be raised as men, leaders, strong and independent. And it's okay, girls do too. Okay? But I'm talking to men. I don't care what passion they have, what hobby they have, what interest they have. You are their example of a man. You are their example of a man. And I promise you, they will follow more of what you do than what you say. So if that character is not in you and acting out daily, it doesn't matter what you say. They're watching what you do. And in essence, with your actions, you're speaking life and death into your children. They're going to look at you and say, that's how a man acts. I will follow that example because it's the only example I have. <clears throat> Ladies, let me speak to you very, very gently and carefully. <laughs> Biblically, biblically, sometimes when we look at the role of women, we figure out how much passion God put in a man for a woman. We figure out... <laughs> How much passion is in your husband for you? Innately designed in us is the desire for the help meet that God gave us. There is a passion that's inside of us to have a wife, to have a woman in our life. We have that passion for that put in us by God. So listen to me. Listen to me, ladies. Satan knows that. So Satan will use you to take down the man. Why? Because he knows how much passion the man has for you. If I look at John the Baptist, he was beheaded because the female Salome said she wanted him to be beheaded. If I look at Adam, we could say he was led by Eve, but the truth is Satan knew to go to Eve first instead of Adam. So he went to Eve and he knew Adam will follow this woman because when he woke up from his sleep and saw Eve, he said, whoa, man. <laughs> uh, Samson gave in to Delilah's nagging. Elijah was sent in fear to a cave by Jezebel. Lot's daughters got him drunk to sleep with him to have children. Uh, there is an innate desire for a man to have that woman. And so Satan will know that and he will use that. So you have to watch that. And I'm going to step on some toes here. But I need you to hear me out because it will make sense if you hear me out. When I go to Ephesians chapter 5, uh, 22 through th the end of the chapter, I learned the relationship of a man and woman in marriage. How it is that a man treats a woman and a woman treats a man. And what the scripture says is that if the man will give 100% and the woman will give 100%, a marriage will work. No, it doesn't say that. That's not what it says. What it says. And, and let me tell you why that system doesn't work. Because you're not the one measuring you. 
the other person is. So when they think they're giving 100%, they'll tell you you're giving 50. But you'll think you're giving 100%, and you'll look at them and say, the problem is not me, I'm giving 100, you're giving 70. And so the measurement system doesn't work because that's not how God designed the marriage. How he designed the marriage to work is husbands love your wives Wives, hang on with me, respect your husband. Now, that's a hard thing. And what's hard about it is, is, man, we're given the charge by God to love our wife the same way that Christ loved the church. Now, if you're not scared to death by that, you don't get how Christ loves the church. I'm scared to death by that. The bar is way up here. I'm having to love my wife like Christ loved the church, and I can't even figure out how he loved the church. He's amazing in what he does for the church. But if you'll go through that set of scriptures, it actually tells you step by step. She's to be a glory unto you. You're to wash her in the water with the word. You're to have her stand beside you to present her to yourself. It goes through the whole thing of what Christ did to cover her, to see her blameless and holy. Man, how many of you got a blameless wife? <laughs> good move, Jim. Jim's going to have a good day. Why would I have that as a criteria in front of me? Because that's how Christ sees the church. He sees the church as blameless. Why? Because he takes the blame. As a man, I have to stand up and say, even when she's wrong, it's mine. I'm the leader. I'm the one who stands up and says, I take this on because she's going to be blameless in front of everybody else. Now listen to me. How do we move into that? Well, it says that she has to respect the husband. Do you notice it never says she has to love the husband? Now let me show you why this works. Because this marriage thing we're doing, I'm doing counseling right now with two or three couples trying to get this concept across. The design of God in a marriage is that the husband would love the wife and the wife would respect the husband. Now, let me just start on one side, the man's side. How many of you men find it easy to love your wife if she doesn't respect you? It's near impossible. It's near impossible. You want to pour out love on this person who's showing you disrespect. And you're like, how am I supposed to love her if she's going to be disrespectful? Now let's go to the women's side. How many of you women want to respect a man who doesn't show you love? If he doesn't show you love, how can you respect him? So what they do is they say, hey, when he starts showing me love, then I'll respect him. Here's the problem. He cannot show you love unless he feels respected. Now listen, it goes both ways. She cannot show you respect unless she feels loved. So here's where the circle of love and respect begins. If you want to feel loved, wives, show respect because the result of respect is love. If you want to feel respected, men, show love because when you show love, she will give you respect. This is making sense. So it's a challenge. It's not because most people will say, when the other does their part, I will do my part. Listen to me. The way God set it up, the other cannot do their part until you do yours. When you begin showing her love, men, she will begin respecting you. And when you begin showing him respect, ladies, he will show you love because it's the result of what you've shown. Let me, let me put it to you this way. It's kind of easy to grasp. In our society, we talk a lot about unconditional love, right? Ladies, do you want unconditional love from the man? Absolutely. Doesn't matter if I'm in a bad mood that day. Doesn't matter what's going on. If I blah, 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 blah. I just want him to say, it's okay, dear. I love you, it's all good. It's, we don't have any problem understanding the concept of unconditional love. There's an expectation that a wife will be unconditionally loved. But watch this. Is there an expectation that a husband will be unconditionally respected? Well, he doesn't reserve my respect. Do you deserve unconditional love? No, we don't deserve unconditional love. It's what we're asking for, but it's what Christ 
gave us. Do you unconditionally respect Christ even though you don't understand what's going on sometimes in your life? Yes. It's the same thing in a husband and wife relationship. It's hard. It's hard because you have to learn, ladies, how does he receive respect? Does he feel respected if I compliment him in public? Does he feel respected if I tell him verbally, I think you're amazing and what you just did today just makes me so proud of you? Uh, men, we have to learn how our wives receive love. I, I sit with so many couples where the husband's wife will say, he doesn't love me anymore. And the husband will literally say, are you kidding me? I'm working 60 hours a week. You're living in a brand new house. I just bought you a car. And she's saying, none of that shows me love. Because he doesn't understand that what she wants is for him to come home at the end of the day, sit down on the couch and say, talk to me. Tell me about your day. Tell me what happened. Maybe she likes a gift. Maybe she likes words of affirmation. But whatever it is, you've got to find that way that she receives love and says, I know he loves me because he does this. Listen to me, ladies, in the same way. I know she respects me because she does this. Got the room real quiet. <laughs> So I'm going to end on this note. This is back for the men. Men. Most of the time we're in church, we get into these circles of men, and we talk about accountability. Iron sharpens iron. You got to have somebody to call on when you're tempted. You got to be able to talk openly with another guy. A guy's got, listen, all of that is good. All of that is good. All of that is healthy. All of that is essential. But I want you to hear me really strongly on this statement. If your accountability is not to God, you will deceive your accountability. This is what I know. I can lie to my friend when he says, have you been tempted to do that? I can say, oh no, I'm good. I'm good this week, even though I haven't. I can lie to my spouse. I can say, no, it's all good when it's not all good. But listen to me. If you go to Hebrews 4.13, it said, God knows all things. All things are known to him. So who can you be accountable to that's a better accountability than God? So when I have to look at my character and say, am I being a man? Am I being a husband? Am I being a father? I don't need your opinion as much as I need God's. Because when I'm accountable to God, I have to move in the things of God. Men, if we could become a men, a group of men who decide that God is my accountability partner, I will stand before God in the decisions I make. I will stand before God with the things I do. Listen to me. I will stand before God on the internet in the middle of the night. I will stand before God when I'm doing my tax returns. I will stand before God when I'm saying something about someone else so that I look good and they look bad. If my accountability is God, I have the best accountability department because he's the only one that knows the truth. He's the only one. Here's how I want to... Thank you so much for joining us today on Revive Us Now. I hope that the word today has been beneficial to you. I hope that the Holy Spirit would just plant it in your heart and you could see the changes come about in your life. If you'd like to know more about Revive Church, join us on our website at reviveusnow.com or come and see us in one of our services on Sunday mornings at 9 or 11 a.m. at 851 Johnson Street in Stewart. Thank you again for being with us. God bless you and have a great day.